Hello, thank you for inviting me for this uh, lecture. Um, this is actually a topic that's quite close to my heart, as I have been writing about this topic for many years. Um, I started out in 1980 studying with Tinyao So, an old Chinese fellow who started the school in Boston, the New England School of Acupuncture. He had a very pragmatic style of practice, do this because it works. Um, he had learned in China 20 years before TCM was developed. My second teacher at the school was Ted Kapchuk and his uh, colleagues and friends, and uh, he was introducing their understanding of uh, the modern Chinese TCM system, which sounded much more interesting because it had a lot more theory attached to it. And then in the second year of studies, we had to practice techniques, and I discovered to my horror that every time I was needle, I fainted, and I just couldn't stand this Chinese needling methods. It felt horrible to me. So I was very relieved towards the end of my second year of studies that this young Japanese woman who had just moved to Boston after finishing school uh, earlier that year um, in, in Japan, um, Kiko Matsumoto did a Friday evening lecture introducing Japanese acupuncture, and when she needled me, I didn't faint. So I thought, I'm going to do this stuff. So I studied with Kiko, who had not yet decided on how she wanted to practice. She was sharing a lot of different treatment methods and ideas, but didn't have a system of practice. Following this in 1985, I met Dr. Manaka in Japan, went to study with him in 1986, sort of so I could help develop and write his book for him in English and practice that style of treatment. And then in 1988, I met some Japanese meridian therapists, specifically Toyohari style, and then started studying that in 1988. So from the beginning, I've never done one thing. I've always had a range of different things that I use. And I currently practice two distinctly different styles of root treatment method. I have a wide range of techniques coming from different traditions of practice for dealing with symptoms and so on. So this is a topic that I'm very familiar with, the idea of diversity within the field. And as I said, I've written a lot about it. And I've also brought the, the conversations about diversity into scientific uh, contexts and discussions. So what I'd like to do is to give an overview of what I think we can say about diversity of acupuncture, looking at history, current practice, and then moving into scientific discussions. And I hope what I have to say is interesting. So, to start at the beginning, Jun acupuncture, as we call it, began somewhere in the, around 150 uh, before Christ. And it began as a treatment model that allowed a practitioner to do something that only individuals had ever been able to do for themselves, and that is to regulate the chi of another person. And um, the, the, the Neijing introduced uh, the concept of the meridians, it introduced the concept of the acupuncture points, and it introduced these nine kind of needles for doing um, treatment. And when we look at the nine kind of needles, two of them were not inserted. Sorry, my picture's in the way over here. Let me just move that out of the way here. Two of the needles were not inserted, um, and then one of them are possibly not inserted. And several of them, especially those at the bottom of the picture here, um, several of them were needle inserted quite deeply. So from the beginning, acupuncture involved non-insertion of needles. So even the term acupuncture is a mistranslation. It's not a, a fair representation of what has been done in the name of John over the last two millennia or so. And the idea of this regulating the patient's chi comes about because the Neijing have proposed that people no, or, or seem to lose the ability to regulate their own chi, which means regulate their emotions, and or they have bad lifestyle or eat badly, which causes dysregulation of chi in their body, causing deficiency to occur, which then allows these disturbances to occur, triggering symptoms and so on. So therefore, acupuncture is introduced as a method for doing, uh, for helping correct that, 
by tonifying what's deficient, draining what's excess, and so on. So it sounds very simple. This, this sounds like a very simple theory, but the the way it was described was very much more vague than I just said. It's much more unclear. Um, of course, you can make it sound very clear, but actually it's not so clear. There's historical descriptions were a bit vague and unclear, which led to many, 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 many different kinds of interpretations and different ways of foci for trying to do what was being recommended. So a natural focus in the Neijing with the introduction of the Jingmai or the 12 meridians was to identify which of the 12 meridians are deficient and tonify them and which are excess and drain them. And already in Ling Shu chapter 10, when the 12 Jingmai, the 12 meridians were first described, they already say in order to understand the condition of the 12 meridians, because they're not visible, you have to palpate the Mai, the pulses. Nanjing, sorry, the Nanjing description of pulse diagnosis was far from systematic and quite contradictory. And I don't know anyone that's actually attempting to reproduce those methods. Instead, what we find is several centuries later, the Nanjing systematized pulse diagnosis quite thoroughly and introduced what we now know as pulse, pulse diagnosis, palpation of the radial arteries for diagnosis um, from that time. And after that, acupuncture theories that had developed as a, for the purposes of using needles to help regulate the chi of a patient started influencing herbal medicine treatises. And then herbal medicine treatises started focusing on um, it, their own methods of diagnosis and so on. And naturally, their focus is quite different. The methods, the theories are quite different. They might use many of the same words, but the intended understanding and the, the purpose of, of using those words is different. This is in part because herbs act on the organs directly, whereas needles are placed on the limbs in the meridians. And for the purposes of trying to influence the internal organs indirectly by regulating the meridians. So naturally the focus of tongue of pulse diagnosis and so on, all these different things were different. So within this framework of the, the herbal medicine acupuncture practice, using many of the same words, in particular the term qi comes up, it was a very uh, important concept. And, but already by the time of the Neijing, when the, the concept of qi was incorporated into the Neijing as a kind of a focus for um, diagnosis and treatment, um, it was already understood very differently. I've written a book in 2014, an editor book with a couple of Spanish colleagues, Restoring Order in Health and Chinese Medicine, describing the history and development and utilization of the concept of qi and the jingmai. How did those concepts develop? Why did they develop? What did people mean by those concepts when they said it? How was it utilized in the in the medical traditions? Why was it described that way? And then how did different traditions of, of practice use these ideas? So from the beginning, we can say that John as a therapy was never uniform. Different tools were described. I showed you pictures of the nine needles. The locations and nature of the points and meridians were unclear already at the time of the Neijing. And they were made clearer by different later textbooks, tried to clarify things, things that were described vaguely. Later authors tried to make them more clear, if you will. But the, 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 these clarifications by different people were quite different, um, leading to really different descriptions again. Um, I wrote about this in a, a book on the history of acupuncture, published in 1999, Understanding Acupuncture, which I um, which attempted to describe the development and history of acupuncture across the world, not only in China or only in Japan. And um, let's take, for example, the concepts of shu shu deficiency excess and the, the counterparts, their treatment counterparts, bu xie, tonification and draining. The way those terms are used in the Neijing and then 
100, 250 years later in the Nanjing are quite different. I wrote an article about this in 2013. In the Nanjing, deficiency excess refers to not enough of the good stuff, that's deficiency, and the presence of this bad stuff, xie, the xie qi, that's excess. And you tonify to strengthen what's deficient, and you remove, literally, you try to drain out of the body the xie, the, xie, the bad stuff. But in the Nanjing, tonification and draining are quite different. The concept of excess and deficiency sound pretty similar. It's difficult to say it's a distinctly different understanding. But when it comes to the description of draining, it's different. It's no longer the act of trying to remove something from the body. It's more a matter of balancing between systems in the body. Redistributing qi. Again, I wrote about this, Paul and Schultz drew attention to this already in 1986. So we see from the beginning that these concepts were quite different. The needling techniques described in the Ling Shu um, refer especially to the needling techniques associated with the superior physician and the needling techniques that the inferior physician does. So by superior physician, that means somebody who's got some specialized skills. And in particular, when you look at the language of needling in the, in the, in the, in the Neijing, it's talking about the development of the practitioner through kind of self-cultivation techniques, I imagine, something like this. It borrowed, the language of needling borrowed extensively from self, prior existing self-cultivation traditions. Because if you want to do something with the chi of another person, you first had to know how to contact chi and work with chi, which is where the self-cultivation traditions comes in. And a beginner who has not learned those things yet, either because they've not studied them or not figured them out over several decades of practice, simply can't do that. So the superior physician refers to the practitioner who has developed that inner understanding and has developed their body is trained to be able to deliver those techniques, the beginner, uh, or somebody who's not interested in these traditional ideas. Uh, the superior is the inferior physician who just knows how to take a needle and stick it in the body. That's quite different. So already we have this big contrast difference and um, that contrast reflects in how needling techniques developed in the 20th century when formal education systems were established, as opposed to multi-year training or multi-year apprenticeships. Formal systems of training in a school supervised and overseen by governments. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to this topic. And again, I wrote a little bit about this in another paper, a scientific paper, about how the concept of duchi primarily refers in the historical literature to what the practitioner feels. It has nothing to do with sensations that the patient feels. So as acupuncture ebbed and flowed over time, as it sort of became uh, more popular, less popular, and so on, as people made efforts to try to make things clearer, um, in particular, point location in the Neijing was really unclear. And Huang Fumi in 282 got really fed up with this. So he wrote his, in his book, Jinju Jai Jing, the systematic classic of acupuncture and moxibustion. He really tried to lay out, okay, here precisely using um, third century anatomical knowledge, here is each of the points. This is their description using their best anatomical descriptions they could come up with. Here's how deep you needle it. Here's how many mocks you can apply it on it. And here's what it's good for. He tried to really systematize points. But then whether it worked or not is not clear. But several centuries later, acupuncture had become known as a deadly therapy. Presumably, people were inserting needles without knowledge of anatomy and puncturing organs and killing people, or they were taking non-sterile needles and inserting them deeply into the body, like into joints, leading to septicemia and death. But for several centuries, acupuncture was known as a deadly therapy. It was very unpopular in China. 
And the solution to this on popularity was proposed by an early Song emperor who became interested in traditional medicine. And he said, well, I think maybe the, 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 the problem with acupuncture is that people don't really know where the points are. So he commissioned Wang Wei to write another textbook clarifying point locations and to even build a statue which can be used for testing students. Okay, and following the publication of the bronze statue textbook and the utilization of the bronze statue, acupuncture came back to life. It became revitalized, leading to a big sort of surge in interest in acupuncture again. And several centuries later, you see the first anatomical pictures of the bar of the meridians, rather imprecise. Um, this is from the Shisa Jingfa Hui in thirteen. I think 1341, and um, then later textbooks attempted to reproduce these pictures, trying to make things clearer again, but slightly different and anatomically rather imprecise. Okay, so let's say, looking at those pictures, looking at the descriptions, where are the points? It sounds like we, we would like to imagine that the points must be in the same place. And, you know, different people, different traditions of practice should be locating these points. At least we can agree on where the points are, right? Um, well, it turns out that's a very incorrect assumption. Let's take, uh, just to give you two examples, okay? Let's take the point Long Five. Historically, in the Neijing, Long Five is described as the pulsation in the crease of the elbow. The Shi Sa Jing Fa Wei described it the same way. The Jenju Da Chang described it basically the same way. Okay, but then what happened in the in the twentieth century? In, sorry, in the nineteen fifties, TCM acupuncture was developed, and um, a quite different needling method was introduced, much deeper needling. And they moved Lung 5 from the brachial artery, which sits on the ulnar side of the brachial tendon. They move Lung 5 to the radial side of the brachial tendon, presumably so as to avoid puncturing the artery, which would be a bad thing to do. So Lung 5 moved in modern China. But actually, in modern Japan and in traditions prior to 1950s in China, Lung 5 remained on the radial artery, so on the brachial artery, on the ulnar side of the tendon. So here we have quite, quite different locations for Lung 5. How about Lung 7? Where's Lung 7? It's approximately one and a half, some proximal to Lung, lung 9. Okay. That's from the 282 Jenju Jaijing. Well, that's not so clear. When the bronze statue text was written, Wang Wei Yi said, no, no, what you do is you, you put your hands together like this and it's at the end of your finger when you do this. Hopefully you can see it in the, in my, in the picture here of me. But actually it's not so straightforward because what happened then is in the 1950s, Long Five, Lung 7 is located on the large intestine meridian on top of the arm up here because they kept the finger straight. Can you see that? The finger is straight. Whereas prior to the 1950s, by teaching Tin Yao So, he would always bend the finger, bend the finger to leave the, so that the end of the finger is on the lung meridian, proximal to lung 8, not on top of the, of the arm here, but on the lung meridian. So again, um, whether you keep the finger straight or you bend the finger slightly so that the tip of your finger lies on the trajectory where the lung reading is supposed to be, um, again, lung seven is located quite differently. So although um, we would like to imagine that the points are the same, turns out there's quite a lot of differences. So while different opinions emerged about the points, the locations of the meridian, the locations of the point, quite different styles uh, and ideas of treatment started emerging. Just to give you another example, Wang Bing's edition of the Su Wen, the oldest surviving tradition of the Su Wen from 762, introduced this system, the, the Wu Yan Liu Qi system, uh, 
otherwise known in popular uh, parlance, popular terms as the stems and branches acupuncture, popularized by Van Buren starting in the 60s and 70s in Europe. And the stems and branches system is the, the Wu Yan Liu Qi, it's really a radical departure because the, the diagnostic approach is quite different. The assumptions of what you're doing are different, etc. The way you select points are quite different than prior ideas. It introduces the notion that over time things might be changing. That's one, certainly one of the ideas there. And this idea of things changing over time, or rhythms of the qi, if you will, led over time to further speculations about points that might close and open. And when they're open, they're more active, which led to the publication of a book in the 12th century, the Zhe Wu Liu Zhu Jin by Hu Ryu Yu, um, uh, describing these biorhythmic variations of points. And that led to, by the 15th century, uh, starting in the Jenju Juying, uh, sorry, Jenju uh, Da Chuan, Jenju Da Chuan, the description of the 10 day cycle, the Nai Jiafa, the daily cycle, Nai Jiafa, and the 60 day cycle, the Lingue Bafa, where different points are opening and closing in these rhythms following daily, 10 day, 60 day cycles. And within these different kind of cyclical forms of acupuncture to do with rhythms of the chi and the meridians and so on, changes in the environment, however you like to explain this stuff, um, treatment is done regardless of patient symptoms or in principle can be done regardless of the patient symptoms. Okay, so that's those are quite radically different systems of acupuncture. Also, during the period when acupuncture became known as a deadly therapy, Moxa Bustian Zhou started to make a comeback. It had been a, a prevalent therapy before the time of the Neijing. You find reference to the applying Moxa to the Mai in textbooks that were excavated in the Ma Wangdui and Jiang Jiashan uh, archaeological digs. And as is typical in Chinese thinking, as a new thing comes along, it doesn't displace and replace and throw away the old stuff. They're sort of the old, the, the people in China typically like to try to integrate things together. It's very typical. Um, uh, Paul Lunchuk refers to this as the, um, the one right way approach that underlies modern scientific thinking, that sort of a dominant way of thinking in um, Judeo-Christian uh, monotheistic type societies. Um, that really didn't happen in China. So the, the 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 end product of this difference of thinking was at the time of the Neijing when they introduced needling as the dominant therapy. Now the clear, you use needles to regulate the qi. Moxibustion was retained, but sort of slips a bit more into the background. It's mentioned. It's not so. It's, it's somewhat systematically described, um, and it starts to be a but of a more limited use. And then the textbooks by Wang uh, Hong for me and Wang Wei, where they were trying to systematize the points, um, they more systematically describe the use of moxa for each of the points. But then, as moxa as acupuncture developed this bad reputation, moxa bustian started to make a comeback during that period, and you see it emerging in Sun Simiao's Chen Jin Yao Fang in the seventh century, where he describes these. Moxibustion only extra points. This weird location over here, if you mox it, it's good for these symptoms. He had this interesting list of points like this. And all and then as this interest in resurgence of moxibustion, this interest uh, develops um, in the 12th century, you see a textbook that describes exclusively the use of moxibustion on acupuncture points to treat any and all diseases. No needling, no moxa, sorry, no needling, no herbal medicine, no massage, only moxibustion. So moxibustion starts to now become a standalone tradition of practice in China, starting in the 12th century in this Huangdi Mingtang Jiaojing text. 
and several other texts that were published after that reinforcing it. And this specialized use of moxa then appears in, Ch in Japan several centuries later and continued in Japan. Okay, today in Japan, moxa bustion is licensed separately from acupuncture in recognition of the fact that for several centuries there have been people been practitioners who only use moxa. They do not use needles. They only use moxa to treat any and all diseases. So this has obvious implications, whatever you think about the limited use of moxa, whatever you think about the contraindications of moxa, think again, they really don't apply. Okay. So let's have another look at this kind of historical variation, the system called the Chiching Bama, the Eight Extraordinary Vessels. They've always been enormously varied. At the time of the, Jin, uh, of the Neijing and Nanjing, you find these emergent ideas, but not really anything systematic that allowed any kind of treatment. And it's not until Xu Feng's Zhenju Dachuan in uh, 1437, that you see a first description of the eight treatment points of the extra vessels. Okay, wrote about this in the a book I did with Kiko on the extraordinary vessels, and also in our book Understanding Acupuncture, the history of acupuncture. And while, for just to give you a, an example of the huge variation, there are three different descriptions of the pathway of the of the Chiang Mai in the Lingshu. Later authors said, well, there must be different branches, but actually there's just as good evidence to suggest not that they were different branches of one thing, but there were three different people's opinions about where is this thing. Okay. And then um, the, the treat, prior, treatment prior to 1437 was pretty much non-existent. Um, it's only with the advent of the description of these eight treatment points that we start to see the extra vessels having a formal treatment. But Li Shijian, who wrote his book in, on the extra vessels, the only traditional historical textbook on the diagnosis and treatment with the extraordinary vessels, he, Qi Jing, Chi Jing Ba Mai Kao in 1578, he refused to acknowledge the existence of these eight treatment points, despite the fact that he was citing from textbooks that described them extensively. Instead, he had a completely radically, radically different theory of the extraordinary vessels. Really different. Okay. So what I want to say is that in the historical and modern periods, there's really, really different ways of thinking about how to treat the extra vessels. So, for example, just in the modern period, there's this following descriptions in Machocha's popular textbooks on TCM, this European American TCM model of acupuncture says, okay, once you've identified you're going to treat the remmai, on women you do the master point lung seven on the on the right and the couple point kidney six on the left. Whereas on men, you do the master point on the left and the couple point on the right. And you do normal Chinese duchy style needling. Okay. However, in the 1950s in Japan, Nagatomo and others and in Germany, Bachmann and others started using master couple points using polarity agents, using zinc copper needles, using gold silver needles. They weren't using the polarity of left and right, they were using the polarity of two different metals, following the principle by which a battery works. The needles are inserted very shallowly, deliberately to avoid the sensory stimulation of the chi. Okay, deliberately to avoid that, but to try to trigger these tiny electrical effects due to using the polarity effects of two different metals in the body. Then in the 1950s, while my teacher, Dr. Manico, was searching for a treatment for, for burns, using some ideas he developed during the war in the 1940s, he developed the ion pumping cord for helping treat burns and he accidentally noticed, accidentally discovered that when the ion pumping cords, which is basically a wire with a diode in it, 
When the red and black clips at different ends of the iron bumping cord are attached to the master couple points of the extra vessels, really big, big changes occur in the body. And he mapped out systematic treatments using this. Okay, um, Again, using a kind of polarity to do with the directional properties of, of this tiny electrical flow in the wire that's allowed because of the presence of the diode. And then also in the 1960s, some people started using north and south pole magnets instead of iron pumping cords or instead of zinc copper or gold silver pairs of needles. All of these different kind of polarity agents um, were each produced different effects. They're all they're kind of similar ideas, but the systems of practice are distinctly different. And in China, since the 1950s, nobody's doing any of the above. Nobody's using the stuff left, right for male, female. They don't do that in China. That's a European invention that's now become relatively popular in the US as well. Then let's have a look at the treatment of children. In China, it was obviously noticed very early, it's pretty difficult to stick needles in kids. Kids won't let you do it. It's really difficult to do treatment. So herbal medicine became a kind of dominant focus in, in treatment of children. And, and today, a survey shows, uh, recently survey shows, practitioners of TCM acupuncture in Shanghai recommend don't use those needling methods on infants and small children. It's not, not appropriate. There are modified Chinese needling methods developed by uh, Julian Scott um, for treatment of children. And whether the kind of needling methods are quite different, they're much milder, but still a kind of duchi is sought. But since the 17th century in Japan, a system called Shonishin or children's needling therapy developed using non-inserted needling methods, using tools of the kind of the kind of tools that you can see in the picture here. I wrote a book about this topic um, and how to practice it. Also, if you look in the historical literature, there's many, 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 many different systems and ideas of treatment. This is especially found when you look at the, sorry, when you look at the, the sort of systematizing compilation textbooks of the Ming Dynasty, especially the Zhenzhou Juying and really especially the Zhenzhou Dacheng, which compiled many, many, many different people's ideas about how to do treatment. So we can clearly see in the historical literature a lot of different treatment methods. And we also see that historically acupuncture has been often linked with moxibustion. We also see it may often be linked with herbal medicine, especially starting in the Song Dynasty. After the Song Dynasty in China, acupuncture starts to be routinely practiced by some practitioners, some traditions alongside herbal medicine. We also see it being separate from herbal medicine. This started in Japan from the get-go when acupuncture and herbal medicine were introduced in Japan in the 7th century they were seen as separate medical traditions and were largely in Japan practiced independently of each other. And then also some people see acupuncture as gen therapy as limit, re related to massage therapies. You see this very typically in, in Japan, but also in China. Here's an, a very nice uh, a map that I found in a re uh, recent publication looking at the historical development of traditional medicines in China. Taiwan, Korea, and uh, Japan. On the left-hand side of this, it describes and refers to how efforts were made to ban, restrict, uh, or suppress traditional medicines. And then in the around after the Second World War, how efforts were made to try to revive traditional medicines to allow them to come back to life. Um, and then on the right-hand side, how the as those once they had revived and come back to life, how they start to be integrated or not integrated into the healthcare systems, um, uh, into insurance coverage and so on. Um, and uh, because the, this paper focused only on herbal medicine from Japan, I'd like to mention in 1870, during the Meiji Restoration, acupuncture was prohibited to be something only medical doctors or blind people could practice because there was a special, for the prior two centuries, there'd been a special uh, practice of acupuncture by blind people. 
and um, in uh, 1848 acupuncture was a moxibustion were licensed separately uh, and massage also licensed separately the three separate licenses in Japan and um, after Nixon opened China in 71-72 acu Chinese acupuncture burst onto the scene and it really spread very rapidly in western countries in Europe the US and so on and the prior knowledge of and practice of Japanese methods and any career methods pretty much vanished at that point. I wrote papers about this topic as well. So modern traditions of practice. Let's look at what happened in China. In China, in order to have a functional healthcare system, Mao decided he realized he needed to retain traditional medicine. So what he did was he had to find a way of allowing traditional medicine to be accepted by the political leadership and at the same time fuse all the different diverse traditions into one that, that allowed an integration of herbal medicine, acupuncture and modern biomedicine. And this, developed, this led to the development of the system called Zhongyi or traditional Chinese medicine written about that um, also, uh, as has Paul and Chilton, many other scholars. Um, and in this system, acupuncture, which is a smaller, simple system, was folded into the larger, more complex system of herbal medicine, so that naturally the focus of diagnosis for acupuncture became on the focus of diagnosis that is normal in herbal medicine, the zangfu, the fluids, etc. Not the meridians. And diagnostic methods associated with that, which come out of herbal medicine, such as tongue diagnosis, start to be routinely used in acupuncture. Okay. And diagnosis is formed in the basis of this. And the reason for this is very simple. You can apply acupuncture on the basis of herbal medicine theories and diagnostic methods. You cannot apply herbal medicine on the basis of acupuncture, normal acupuncture, historical diagnosis and treatment method, and theories and diagnosis methods. You can't do that, it's not safe and probably not effective. So what happened with needling in China? Well, in this period in the 1950s where they had to revive traditional medicine and systematize it and at the same time train as many people as rapidly as possible because China faced what the WHO had described as the world's worst public health crisis. Okay, they had to begin training be uh, they had to train beginners on how to do something with a needle and train as many as, as possible, as quickly as possible. And it was they found that if you insert needles more deeply and you do it, uh, move the needle around so as to provoke the sensory stimulation, which they call du qi, you can train people quite quickly and they can all do something that is effective. But that's, uh, this is documented in a paper in 2010, where they say, well, yeah, for the purposes of training students, that was a good thing, but please don't confuse du qi with the sensory stimulation of moving a needle around in the body. Okay, I've written about this, because we'll see that the Japanese also had to deal with how do you teach people who are beginners how to do something that's difficult. You have to teach them simple things. So in Japan, the differences in Japan and development of acupuncture in Japan are quite different. There's no influence of herbal medicine. There's a complete lack of it. Acupuncture and herbal medicine developed separately from each other. And during the Meiji Restoration, the law was passed. A law was passed that said only medical doctors can prescribe herbs. That law is still on the books today, with the exception that some pharmacists are also allowed to prescribe herbs from their pharmacy. But acupuncturists, who are not doctors or pharmacists, it's completely illegal for them to prescribe herbs. And they also don't refer for herbs. They're in competition with each other. Okay. So, um, therefore, acupuncture does not use the theories of herbal medicine focusing on the Zhang Fu and the fluids, etc. It does not use things like tongue diagnosis because tongue diagnosis developed in herbal medicine. 
okay um, acupuncturists in in by and large in japan tend to have a much broader spectrum of ideas some follow traditional logic and there's a traditional system that developed in the 1930s called kerako chirio became relatively sort of the dominant traditional form of acupuncture by the 1950s that's called meridian therapy focusing on traditional ideas but the most common method you'll probably find in japan is much more pragmatic do this because it works other people tried this they found this do it because it works not really a lot of clear theory and then there's some that have a theory that's more attempting to follow knowledge of the anatomy of the body, needle here to stimulate that structure, or, or having some kind of scientific sounding explanation of what they're doing without any true scientific experiments to validate the use of those theories. Um, but anyway, um, uh, th this is probably the more common thing is some kind of stimulation model of the body using needles moxa to stimulate the body and then there's also people many thousands of practitioners in japan only using moxa no needles the fukaya style the sawada style and there's also some that create entirely new ideas that I, I have met some practitioners in Japan who are very creative and innovative out of their own ideas and, and training, develop quite new methods of practice. The field in Japan is very large. If we look at meridian therapy, how did they have to deal with the needling methods? What they found was you can't reproduce what, what it says in the Neijing. Beginners can't do what it says in the Neijing about tonification and draining it's not possible for beginners to do that because only superior practitioners people with experience and extensive training can do that so what they did was they focused on reproducing descriptions of needling in the neijing like shallow insertion of needles in the direction of flow using the breath they sought to reproduce what it said to create an effect that a beginner can reproduce with the hope that over time practitioners would develop to be able to do more sophisticated needling. So, for example, Brodian therapy in the 1930s and in the 1950s involved insertion of needles very shallowly using these different descriptions of, of uh, historical descriptions of needling to do with angle, breath, etc. And then by the 60s, you start to see more routine use of non-inserted needling methods. So today, many people who practice meridian therapy who are more experienced with more understanding of how to work with chi and a needle are doing non-inserted needling methods. What's the implication of all of this in terms of research? Well, one of the big problems we have is generalizability. We have a lot of clinical and physiological studies on acupuncture. Okay? And therefore, we can lump all of these things together and say, acupuncture is good for this. Acupuncture does that. Right? And there's lots of different things. This is a, the most recent systematic review meta-analysis that I was associated with, uh, but also there are these bigger publications on chronic pain where acupuncture is generically, all the different things that are done in the name of acupuncture are lumped together. The problem is you can't generalize these results to any individual style of practice. I'm going to talk about this, okay? This is a problem for us scientifically. This is from a, another recent paper to, uh, about sham acupuncture. And here I've tried to capture, if I move my picture here to the top of the screen, here I've tried to describe, capture on the left-hand side these really gentle methods of non-penetrating needling. And as you move across towards the right, the methods become a bit stronger. The needles start to be inserted. They're inserted deeper, more stimulation, stronger stimulation on the right-hand side. And the, the idea of introducing this is that you've got th these different treatment methods described at the top, but you get different kind of physiological, biological actions associated with these treatment methods, depending upon where the needle is. So, for example, I'm sorry. Um, 
Here we go. For example, we might do needling where needle is inserted, is not inserted, it's applied gently on the surface of the skin. Or we do needling, and this is examples of the treatment methods, we do needling again without penetration, but with firmer contact, causing maybe even some slight discomfort. Or we do needling that's very shallowly inserted, uh, deliberately trying to avoid sensory stimulation with the needle. Again, different examples of this. Or we might insert needles a bit deeper. Again, still trying to avoid sensory stimulation, but trying to influence that deeper muscular structure, for example. Or we do needling deliberately trying to provoke sensory stimulation or we do that more strongly adding for example electrical stimulation to maximize that sensory stimulation okay these are different treatment methods and um, the reason i describe it like this is that different influences touch pressure uh, causing some slight discomfort penetration of the skin starting sensory stimulation building it up building it up they trigger different kind of biological actions as you can obviously understand from this picture here this is from a paper in 2012 which catalogues the the range of different structures and associated physiological uh, effects that have been documented associated with needling if your needling is applied only on the surface, those structures at the surface of the body will respond. If your needling involves some pressure, just triggering some slight discomfort, other structures are involved. If your needling is a bit through the skin very shallowly, additional structures start to be stimulated. And I point all of that out because sham acupuncture, we'll come back to this, uses non-penetrating needling or shallow insertion needling okay we'll come back to this this is a big topic okay so one of the things we have about this is if we understand what's happening is from needles that just touch the surface of the skin go through inserting even if you go deeper you're still stimulating the structures above which are associated with non-inserted needling associated with shallow insertion needling Okay, it becomes really difficult to say which one, which which of these structures, which of these mechanisms are specific to your style of needling. Okay, and um, so therefore it becomes difficult to distinguish these things. And the, in order to be able to identify the action of doing this particular kind of needling especially when you go deeper your sample size requirements become ginormous really very large um, uh, the first paper to describe this problem was uh, by Lewis and Machin in 1983 pretty much largely ignored since then okay so let's have a look at further issues around specificity here. The attempt to describe specific effects of acupuncture in clinical trials led to the use of sham acupuncture, just as a placebo control treatment in, is attempting to demonstrate what or to test what is the effect of this specific chemical ingredient in the pill. You use a placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trial where there's the absence of the chemical ingredient in the placebo pill. The equivalent of doing something like this uses sham acupuncture. That was the idea. Okay. And, but a lack of knowledge of what constitutes the practice of acupuncture led to the use of non-penetrating needling and shallow insertion needling as sham acupuncture treatment. I wrote about this in a paper published earlier this year. These mimic forms of acupuncture and are not inert. Again, wrote about this in another paper on, on uh, sham acupuncture this year. And we even published a systematic review with meta multiple meta-analyses on biomarkers triggered by needling in the acupuncture treatment arm and needle and sham and uh, triggered by the sham acupuncture needling in the sham arm. Okay, multiple biological mechanisms are associated. It's definitely not inert, but not only is it not inert, it triggers clinical effects that are helpful for the patient, sometimes even more effective than 
the real acupuncture, the clinical trial here on IVF that I listed just now, uh, the sham acupuncture was significantly more effective than the real acupuncture. Okay, and systematic review of studies that applied the sham acupuncture to the same location as the real acupuncture shows that sham acupuncture is an effective clinical technique. Okay, and what what happens is when you're using wrong methods for the sham acupuncture because they're not inert and they trigger these biological effects that are clinically effective, you create underestimation of the effectiveness of acupuncture, which is routinely happening, both in clinical trials and systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and you also trigger bias against acupuncture. Sham acupuncture is highly problematic. So it's also difficult to therefore demonstrate the specificity of the acupuncture of acupuncture, or the specificity of action of acupuncture. Let's have a look at the TCM system. We would like to imagine that there's enough research being done that we can say, yes, when we look at the world literature on clinical trials and evidence for acupuncture, we can say, yes, it's an effective therapy. But actually, what is TCM? Let's start with how the fact that it's poorly defined. It's much more inconsistent. I first started publishing on this, unfortunately, in 1997. The, the different textbooks describe patterns of diagnosis differently. Um, also, uh, more recently, looking at the description of blood stasis from a literature review of how do people describe the signs and symptoms of blood stasis, and there's considerable variability in how that's described. And in fact, that variability is probably predictable because of the necessary influence of biopsychosocial systems and how they influence the practice of any medical system. And again, this was documented in the most recent paper just published a few weeks ago about uh, looking at qi deficiency, qi stagnation and showing just as with the blood stasis, enormous variability in how people conceptualize what what are the signs and symptoms of this, What how they describe that, and also evidence that Westerners tend to focus on different things than do people in China or Asia. Okay, so, and also if we start to look at the, uh, while well, some studies have say, uh, when we look at clinical trials, some studies say, oh, we tested TCM acupuncture. There's not so many of them that have done that, that than you might imagine, that allows us to say, yes, it's TCM acupuncture that's effective. Let's have a look at this, okay? So if you want to say, is acupuncture an effective therapy? You can't really say. To answer that question more technically or more fully, it's to do with the fact that there's not enough studies across all of the clinical trials of acupuncture to allow a sub-analysis of TCM style that you can generalize, yes, TCM style acupuncture is effective. The same is true for any other style. All of them have the same problem. Okay, this is a this is a technical statistical problem. There's just simply not enough studies, but it's more than that. Um, it, it's not only to do with sample size requirements not being sufficient. You need really large sample size requirements to be able to do this. But further, in order to test TCM, you need to guarantee that it was actually TCM. I've written letters to the editor about clinical trials that said, oh, we tested TCM acupuncture. And then when you look at what they did, it wasn't TCM acupuncture. It's whatever the acupuncturist in the trial did, and he called it TCM acupuncture, but it's not generalizable to what constitutes the practice of acupuncture. There was a paper published on asthma in Switzerland in 2003, I think it was, and I wrote a letter to the editor pointing out the limitations of that at that time. So, um, the, the problem of guaranteeing, um, yes, you're doing acupuncture in this clinical trial. Well, in, in, in principle, Stricter was supposed to help guarantee that, but it alone is not enough. Saying that you're doing it doesn't guarantee that's actually what you're doing. You also need to have guaranteed validation of the TCM diagnostic patterns. 
And essentially, that really hasn't happened. Almost no clinical trials that have tested TCM-style acupuncture, even if they've legitimately practiced what we can recognize as TCM acupuncture, they've never validated their diagnostic methods. Almost none of them. Therefore, you can't generalize about this. You can't say TCM-based diagnosis and treatment works, right? So the requirements of testing clinical trials requ requires that you have uh, more clearly defined protocols. Um, the, 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 the whole process requires that you apply certain steps to be able to guarantee this. If you want to say in this study, the use of TCM-based treatments were more effective than the, the criteria that allow you to make that kind of statement at the end of a clinical trial and for that statement to be scientifically valid have not yet really been properly defined. I'm part of the, an international uh, group called the International Pattern Identification Network Group, um, where we're looking at the role of pattern identification, or in Chinese, that's bian zheng. It's different terms in Chinese, in, in Jap Japan, Korea, etc. Um, but we've written papers about this. We've also looked at how pattern identification is described in clinical trials. And it's not not so systematically done. We've also written overviews of this area and we're hoping at some point to write a paper that is, describes the fundamental steps required to allow researchers at the end of a TCM clinical trial to be able to say in this study the use of TCM diagnosis-based treatments were more effective than. But that paper hasn't been finished yet. Okay. So how do you guarantee diagnosis? Well, actually the methods, it's very complicated. Probably the most promising methods have been developed by Michael Popperwell, you know, published his PhD in 2018 and from Australia. And, uh, but up at present, what we can say is there's very poor evidence for the reliability of diagnosis in any traditional systems of acupuncture, including in TCM. Okay, so we don't have enough evidence to support using clinical trials, or let alone to support the conclusions from TCM based acupuncture clinical trials. So, in Western countries, we know we see diversity as normal. After graduating acupuncture school as an individual, you can continue to practice what you learned. You can go deeper into it. You can find teachers to help you go further and deeper into that system. And you don't learn other systems of practice. But much more commonly, people after finishing acupuncture school find the limits of what they've learned or they're not entirely confident about everything they've learned or they have questions about it. They hear about some really interesting sounding workshop or their colleague or friend is practicing this other system and they run off and take these other workshops and learn these other systems. I've mentioned a few here from China or Taiwan or Korea or Japan, etc. And then different Western styles, the Yamamoto scalp acupuncture for stroke and pain, etc. There's all these different styles of practice that you can run off and learn these workshops or take programs to learn the, the system in more detail. And or if you are not satisfied with your acupuncture practice, you might learn herbal medicine. In, in China and Korea, it's routine to learn herbal medicine when you learn acupuncture, especially in Korea. Um, but it, and, and also the schools of acupuncture in the US and in Australia routinely teach herbal medicine alongside acupuncture. You learn the two together. In Europe, many schools don't do that. Herbal medicine is learned after the fact. Okay. And if you don't learn herbal medicine and use it alongside your acupuncture, maybe you want to learn some other system like homeopathy. And there was the method developed by Vol in the 1950s, 60s, um, the electroacupuncture according to Vol, using uh, electrical diag electrodiagnostics, electrodermal diagnostic systems, and then uh, allowing you to use um, uh, acupuncture and prescribed uh, uh, homeopathic treatments together and so on. Um, and the, or you might learn massage and there's many people using massage alongside their acupuncture. 
There's many different systems and combinations that people do. Many people also come to acupuncture with knowledge of another therapy as a psychotherapist, a psychologist, or as a medical doctor, a specialist in oncology, learning acupuncture to supplement that, and so on. So many people are learning acupuncture with uh, alongside or learning many different styles of acupuncture. This kind of polar this sorry this kind of um, diversity is completely normal okay and people generate their own unique combinations of therapy and there's been quite a few people uh, uh, surveys of practitioners show most practitioners are doing something like this we did a survey looking at uh, 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 practice different systems of practice or another survey in within the etcma looking at different systems of practice and so on but diversity is very common mixing and matching different combinations of therapies is very typical so beside these historical variations that you can find in historical in the his, written texts um, there's also other causes of variation um, medicine should be not static it needs to constantly be evolving otherwise it becomes less effective over time and uh, Paul Unschultz has described how the some of these medical traditions medical ideas because they became stagnated and they became kind of fixed when new problems arise like a new uh, an outbreak of a new infectious disease arise, aro arose in China that model of practice was inadequate and because Shang Han Lon model of thinking for that new infectious disease didn't fit the bill a new model of therapy developed the the when being the 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 system of herbal medicine prescribing and so on the this kind of the ability for the therapy for medicine to continually develop is important for the survival of that medical therapy if you will and so as thing as the medical system develops it's always going to be changing adapting to its new environment changing uh, the, the 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 time over time the environment is changing in different countries in different cultures the environment is changing modern medicine recognizes if you the the, the this biopsychosocial influences create differences in the way uh, something may emerge and be practiced in a particular country. For example, if you look at the DSM-5 um, and you look up the, the diagnosis of depression, there are internationally recognized standard criteria for identifying depressed patients. But at the same time, at the end of that section on depression, it lists what are the cultural variants that are normal in different countries. Okay, this this is quite normal, but this kind of bio this kind of diversity of practice within the systems. The same thing has happened in acupuncture in China as circumstances, as time, as different uh, developments occurred in China. Acupuncture kept adapting and changing as acupuncture spread to China, to Korea and then to Japan and then to other Asian countries it kept adapting and changing it's normal when it came to the West it kept adapting and changing and in fact it has been argued by some modern scholars that in the 1950s 60s 70s some people in China were adapting acupuncture in China Chinese medicine in China to make it more appealing to Westerners so that it would be easier for Westerners to take it up because it seemed more familiar. Okay. So when we wrote about this diversity, and as I said, I've written about this in a lot of different uh, texts, books specifically, book chapters and so on. Um, there's a chapter on diversity. Um, we, we basically argued, I've argued for decades, that acupuncture, that this diversity is a fundamental feature of acupuncture, um, especially in our book, Understanding Acupuncture, we wrote about this. And in fact, it's probably this diversity, this flexibility of the system is what allows it to move to different countries, different cultures to survive over time in the same country, okay, to allow it to survive. It has never 
been one thing. It's always something different. And in fact, as I mentioned, uh, um, uh, early Chinese thinking, um, this idea of a one right way is a real anathema to early Chinese thinking. Um, in China, it was quite typical to not be thinking the one right way, but to think about, okay, how do we make this a useful idea? Okay, very practical way of thinking. So I would argue diversity is a fundamental feature of acupuncture, which explains why concepts like qi, meridians, the acupuncture points, etc., were all initially very poorly defined and why that vagueness allowed people to come up with descriptions which suited them at their time in their culture to be able to use those ideas that fit them in their practice and make it work for them. So it's a, a kind of a way of adapting acupuncture to this new environment. My teacher, Yoshio Manaka, he suggested that maybe the flexibility, the vagueness and flexibility of these old ideas, chi, the meridians, the points, etc., is more like a kind of a software. It's, he wrote about this in his book, Chasing the Dragon's Tail. Um, the, the body, which is made up of this different hardware, is in disorder. The things have gone wrong, you've developed symptoms, and the theories of acupuncture are a kind of software description that allow us to take action, to try to do something to restore the body back into a healthier condition using these jun, these needles. Why do some people think that acupuncture has always been practiced the way they do it? Mm. Well, maybe because they think claiming this historical legacy, right? This historical tradition helps authenticate what you're doing. Is that dumb? So I've written about this, that this is typically what people do when they say they're practicing traditional acupuncture. Let me move my picture out the way again, down over here. Um, that this is a, a typical way that you authenticate the tradition of practice. Um, and using class labels like classical acupuncture is a, a very strong way of trying to claim that authenticity. Um, but and for sure, practicing something that other people have already done lends it an air of authority and legitimacy. But how old is that tradition really? When did it start? The notion that somebody who doesn't read a word of Chinese is practicing a tradition that dates back to Han Dynasty China is when only a tiny fraction of Chinese texts have ever been translated. It's, it's anyway, I'm a little bit skeptical, let's put it that way. And another thing about whatever tradition that you practice, it's never exclusive. There's multiple traditions. There always have been. The idea that you're, what you're doing is this is the way it is, is, I think, political. And it's largely to do with imagination and, dare I say, often insecurity. Why do people say this is the way to practice acupuncture? I find many people saying things like this. Is it because of poor knowledge? Is it because people feel they need seeking security so they're doing the right way of doing it so they feel like this is the proper way to do it? Modern medicine deals with this these insecurities by coming up with protocols and developing evidence-based models of practice to to create a layer of more secure thinking that allows a secure form of practice. Right now, it, it's kind of, this is a, an, anyway, I, I don't mean to dwell on this, but anyway, um, I think all medical practices is subject to these insecurities. Is this really the right thing to do? Is this how the best way of doing it? Okay. So if you just believe this is the way to do it, well, you don't have to worry about that. Or you're less likely to worry about that. Anyway, the answers to all these things are not clear. I did write about it in our book, Understanding Acupuncture. We speculated, we gave a few examples of how these uh, biopsychosocial historical influences may have uh, affected how people reason what they're doing or say about what they're doing and so on. Anyway, I hope what I said was interesting uh, and useful and Thank you for listening.
I'm going to end here.